Joining us now is the man who nominated Justice Ginsburg for the court, former President Bill Clinton. Good morning to you. Good morning, Margaret. I'm told you spent time with Justice Ginsburg last September down in Little Rock when she was in poor health. She was just coming out of the hospital, but she had promised to give this speech, and she was determined to give it. And the people down there appreciated it. People were really pulling for her, and they really gravitated to her because of her sense of equality and fairness. And they thought, unlike much in politics today, she was totally on the levels. She just never stopped going. She said keeping uh, her work was keeping her alive, and she just kept doing it, and she had a good time doing it. Why did you select her? Because I found uh, that she had the best combination of uh, skills and instincts of any of the people I interviewed. And boy, I interviewed some great people. And I reviewed 40 candidates, settled on five, then got down to three. But I just, uh, you know, Hillary mentioned it uh, to me. She thought I ought to look at her more closely. So I read, first of all, the account of the cases uh, on gender equality she would prevailed in in the Supreme Court as a lawyer. Before she ever even went on the Court of Appeals, she'd done enough to shape American law for a generation. Then I read her Court of Appeals decisions, and I really was uh, intrigued. So I invited her to the White House to come talk to me. And uh, she came on a Sunday night, and we weren't interrupted. And after she'd been there about 10 minutes, I just knew that I wanted to appoint her because I wanted somebody who was open-minded, passionately committed to equality, and capable of working in the setting of the Supreme Court. I figured of all the people I'd met, she had the best judgment on when to work with others whenever she could and when to stand up when she couldn't stand it anymore. And she proved for 27 years that I was right about that. She turned out to be even better than I thought. The New Yorker reported that when her name was first floated to you by, by Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, you had some misgivings. Why? I don't remember that. I, first of all, the, there were... Uh, everybody that I know is <laughs> taking credit now for, for 27 years for nominating her, but <laughs> I didn't have misgivings. I, I know that I did what I always do. I said that I would look at it, and I'd, if I'd heard any questions, I would ask those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, for example, I was intrigued by her, a number of her opinions and her ideas that she, she thought she supported the, uh, a woman's right to choose, but thought that the case should have been decided under the Equal Protection Clause rather than the constitutional right to privacy. I wanted to know why. When we met, I did talk. But uh, there were some people who thought she was Ironic, it's being funny now, thought she was too conservative. Mm -hmm. And that's because anything that's political tends to be two-dimensional, almost cartoonish in its demand for labeling. And she was not a woman to be labeled with. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was who she was. And I was immensely impressed. If a Democrat were in the White House and the Democrats had control of the Senate, wouldn't they insist on a vote and a nomination while in control? I don't know. There is a difference between what happened with Judge Garland. That is, with Judge Garland, you're talking about missing probably 
of one and a half uh, full terms of courts. It was almost a year. But there is a tradition of the president foregoing an appointment when you're closer to the election. Uh, Abraham Lincoln faced this very thing in early October, just as Roger Tony died. And he couldn't know for sure whether he was going to win re-election, so he knowingly waited until after the election he thought the people deserved to have a say. Now, that's what Senator McConnell said they deserved back in mm -hmm. 10 months before the presidential election of 2016. So it didn't take them long to change their tune. But that is their tune. But mm -hmm. you can't be possibly be surprised that uh, Senator McConnell and uh, President Trump are taking the position they are. They're there for whatever maximizes their power. I don't know do you, what the Democrats would do. Do you think this galvanizes Democratic or Republican voters more? Are, are Democrats missing an opportunity not having talked about the potential vacancy earlier on in this race? Uh, probably. But, uh, you know, we, we all respected Justice Ginsburg a lot, and we thought we had no business talking about her as if she were already gone. And we were hoping she would live so, uh, longer. And so uh, I don't think there's anything to be done about that. Mm -hmm. But I think that the voters should at least have to know that uh, if you put one more uh, conservative, particularly a, um, ideologically conservative Republican on the court, they're giving up the health care bill uh, for, you know, 20 million people's health insurance, losing all the pre-existing conditions for tens and tens of millions of people, no help on the other front. That's a, just one example. Mm -hmm. So there are consequences, but there are a lot of other things that could go either way. And so uh, there's a lot at stake here. And since it's only 40 days, I think that maybe the Democrats should leave. There are no rules on this. There's no law, so we'll just have to see what happens. But the, if we're going to have a vote, then it's important that that the Democrats and the Republicans make absolutely clear that the voters understand what the consequences of it are. Mr. President, thank you for your time and your reflections.